Welcome to the Hedgineer Podcast with your host, Michael Watson. Hedgineer. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Hedgineer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Watson, where we talk about hedge funds, uh, prop trading, asset management, and how they use data, AI, and technology by interviewing some of the experts that are building some of it. Uh, so today, I have a special guest, Kirk McEwen, founder of CarbonArk. He's been in the industry for a very long time. Like if you've been in the space, you'd obviously know the name, uh, kind of a legend, if you will. Uh, built out the proprietary research teams at multiple different multi-managers across the street. Uh, Kirk, really excited to have you on the show. Hey, Michael. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, likewise. Um, so one of the things I love asking the guests, especially they've had after they've had such a prolific career, like just walk me through how you got into the space, how you started working with um, asset management and then data, technology, AI to ultimately get us to the point where you're founding like this pretty badass company. So start from the beginning. I mean, going all the way back, uh, and it's, you know, unfortunately back a longer way than I'd like. Uh, you know, my, fir my first job on Wall Street was my junior year of college. Um, I got an internship at uh, Tudor Investments. Uh, so I worked at Tudor uh, as a junior in college in their venture group up in Boston. Um, so I spent the summer of 1999, uh, to, put a, to put a pin in it, um, calling CEOs and CFOs of private companies to see if they needed growth capital. That was during the, um, the, the first internet bubble. Um, and uh, Tudor as, as a venture firm um, was relatively new to the market. Uh, they, they had, you know, largely been obviously Paul Tudor Jones and a macro hedge fund complex for a number of years. The equities business had started in the early 90s and the venture business grew out of the equities business. And so I spent uh, that summer uh, cold calling and, uh, you know, sort of, you know, learning a bit about the business and then, you know, sort of did that uh, part time during my senior year and converted it into a full time position after college. So. I started in June of 2000 at Tudor as an analyst in the venture group. Awesome. How do you go from there? Because like you don't yeah. immediately start building out proprietary research teams no, for no. multi managers. No, so so it, it was it was it was a great experience. Uh, you know, Tudor was this an incredible you know sort of group of people, not only in Boston but also globally. Um, and uh, I got to work for some you know sort of some really uh, great investors in Boston. Jimmy Pilata ran that office. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, it was a meaningful thing to be, you know, sort of in that group watching all of these senior players invest in the markets. It was during a crazy time. It was, you know, sort of post-internet bubble collapse. 9-11 um, happened while I was at, uh, at Tudor. Uh, and, and so I was in a venture group that was, you know, sort of, you know, sort of making our chops um, during that time. And so I spent a lot of, uh, lot of hours uh, literally building out and understanding ecosystems uh, to then call to try and get deals in. A lot of deals weren't getting done. Um, 2001 to 2003 was a pretty quiet time uh, for venture capital. It was more about managing your operating portfolio than putting new money to work. Uh, and so, uh, you know, given sort of that, uh, that trajectory, I went back to business school. Uh, I went to MIT, um, you know, sort of went to Sloan, which was an incredible experience. Um, and between my, the summer between my first and second years, I worked in American Express up in Boston on their hedge fund and mutual fund products. Um, it was run by, uh, you know, a few guys from Fidelity and, and, and somebody I'd worked with at Tudor was over there. And I was an intern covering stocks and, and sort of learning about the public markets at that point. Um, coming, out of, coming out of business school, and this, this is the story that actually leads into the original proprietary research builds. Um, I, I was interviewing on, on, in, in New York. I wanted to move to New York. Um, you know, I, was, I wanted to work at a hedge fund and it was 2005. And back then, you know, sort of, I didn't have banking in my background. Um, you know, my accent was a lot thicker than it is today. I was super rough around the edges. You know, this is, this is, this is way cleaned up relative to where I was 20 years ago. Um, I, and I was getting a ton of interviews because I had a great experience at Tudor and I had a really good network. Um, but I, you know, sort of, uh, frankly, you know, I wasn't seasoned enough to, to get my foot in the door um, at most places. And so I had a really tough interview process. Um, I went into an interview on a Friday at four o'clock and I thought I was having a cup of coffee uh, with, the, with the, f the founder of that firm. And I ended up getting passed around to all the analysts in there and I got beat up pretty good. Um, one of the guys told me that I'd never work on Wall Street. And uh, I, I left there and, and, and the next week I had an, I had an interview um, at, at, a, at, a, at a firm uh, in Connecticut. 
And uh, I had to look at the Sears Kmart uh, transaction. And that was 2005, and Eddie Lampert had just bought Sears, and he was using Kmart as that as as the as the uh, as the vehicle. And the only publishing analyst was Gary Balter. Gary Balter was a CSFB, if I remember correctly, and he had he was the only guy that had put numbers out on the deal. And so uh, I locked myself in the computer lab at MIT, and I wasn't going to have another bad interview. And I did. Uh, I sent out hundreds of cold emails to the heads of supply chains of every major customer and supplier of Sears and Kmart. And I got on the phone with the head of supply chain for Scott's Miracle Grow and Whirlpool and Procter and Gamble. And I got to the former head of logistics for Sears to map out the distribution center network. And I walked 30 stores. And I literally did everything I could do to pull together assumptions that were informed by the real world. And I built a 30 page merger model that was held together with duct tape. And, uh, you know, somebody later called it a Fisher Price model, uh, but it worked. And it basically, the basic differentiation in the model was that, you know, sort of, uh, I was seeing through the work and the conversations I was having with these, all these supply chain players, that there was going to be $2 billion of synergies from the transaction, not the 500 that Gary Balter had published. And so that was the differentiator in the model. That was the core crux of what I was going to walk in and interview on. And so I walk in the next week. I've got a call list of like 40 people that I reached out to and I've got this model and I push them both across the table, have this interview and they throw the model in the trash and they're like, how do you get to all these people? How'd you do this? And I was like, oh, I called, you know, I was like, if I can send them an email, you know what I mean? Um, and, uh, and they said, could you do it again? And I said, yeah, I can do that again. So they gave me Goodyear Tire and I did a project on Goodyear Tire and I reached out to distributors and retailers and I went to tire stores and I did all the things and they were like this really interesting and they gave me another project and they said hey you want an unpaid internship and I was like no dude I, I, I need to get paid right so um, I ended up con converting a, a job opportunity with Hunter Global um, which was a, a shop on Madison Avenue so I got my foot in the door and I landed there in June and, and started working and, and, and you know sort of and along the way I'd interviewed with a couple of shops and I had gotten, you know, and that project got me into final rounds. And so I was, so I had started from getting knocked out of the blocks off the first call. And then I did this project, had this great experience. And then I started getting into final rounds. And I got into final rounds at places like Oxif and Glenview um, and met some great people and ended up at Hunter Global, which was fantastic and started working on for-profit education and doing that kind of work. So I got sort of into um, really understanding the for-profit education space from cradle to grave, uh, from a bottoms up perspective to really understand um, how the business operated, how the business worked um, and sort of, uh, and, and I was talking to people all along the way, building relationships in the channel, using the expert networks, finding my own people, et cetera, et cetera. So real deep tissue due diligence around this ecosystem. And I ended up getting a call at the end of the year from, uh, from the guys at Glenview and they were opening an office in London and they offered me a seat and I jumped and um, went over to, to Glenview at the beginning of 06 and, um, you know, sort of got to work for Larry and, uh, and John Roden and, 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 and sort of just a, an amazing group of people. And what was cool about, you know, sort of that time there was about two weeks after I got there, I was covering consumer and TMT uh, and I was going to be moving over to London. I started doing uh, primary research projects on other people's names. So um, I was looking, I looked at Netgear. I looked at SanDisk. Um, uh, I started doing work in, you know, sort of the, some of the healthcare stuff where Glenview had, you know, a huge base of operations and did really well and, um, and started, you know, sort of doing calls in those spaces, moved over to London. But, you know, within six months, I was sort of running, you know, eight to 10 to 15 calls a day, tracking change in the businesses that we cared about, right? And at the end of 06, uh, beginning of 07, um, I, I had my review and they were like, you know, you, you're a good analyst, but you're, you're, you're better at this, uh, at, at this primary research business. So why don't you build one? So, um, you know, at first, you know, it was funny. I, I, I was, I was given this sort of mandate and I was crushed. I was actually crushed. Cause like, you know, in, in, in the world that the, you know, sort of, I sort of always, you know, uh, you, you know, I always saw this vision of like being an analyst to a senior analyst, to a portfolio manager. And that's where all the glory is. And that's where, you know, that's, that's where, that's where the big dogs play. Right. And, uh, and, and then, you know, so, so somebody I worked for gave me the blind side and I read the blind side by, uh, Michael Lewis. And the, the, you know, the, the, the cool thing about the blind side, um, was really the, the whole expose and exposition around the idea that, 
um, you know, sort of their quarterbacks and their linemen. And uh, when Lawrence Taylor innovated the defensive end position, he changed the value of the uh, left tackle position because left tackle protects the blind side, right? And so the innovations in that position that LT created uh, changed the way uh, the left tackle position was was valued. And I sort of looked at it, it was it, with the idea of, okay, if I'm going to be a left tackle, I'm going to be the best left tackle on the, on the field, right? And uh, and so I, I built a business at, at, at Glenview that was uh, at, at its peak, 11 guys on two continents doing 12,000 calls a year, tracking 60 supply chains globally. Uh, I was doing a couple thousand calls myself, um, you know, and I was covering sort of, uh, you know, a, a meaningful number of names across that and learning uh, how the supply chains worked and how the ecosystem worked. I was going down in mines in Australia and going to factories in Shenzhen and, uh, you know, walking malls in Japan. So, like, I wanted to understand what it is I was talking to all these folks about. And we did a ton of work. And then, you know, sort of, and, and, and then, you know, sort of the, the expert network, um, you know, sort of investigation and, and, and subsequent, you know, deep dive into how people were collecting information on Wall Street came in. And, you know, sort of, we, 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 we didn't have any issues with that. Um, but realized that we needed to sort of uh, control our supply chain tighter. And so we built our own database and, um, you know, sort of uh, really focused on how to structure um, a wildly, you know, sort of uh, uh, scalable and compliant framework. Um, and that was something that was great about working with Larry was he was always very focused on doing the next right thing. And, um, and, and, and so we, we built and structured this really meaningful call center business. And I was there for um, you know, through 2010 through 2012. And then, um, you know, I ended up, uh, you know, sort of leaving there at the end of, the, in the middle of 2012. And uh, I landed uh, at, at SAC Capital um, working for Steve Cohen um, last day of 2012. So I was a New Year's baby. Um, you know, I got there at uh, 12, 31, tw uh, 12, and I was there until uh, February of 21, um, where I built um, a number of different uh, research businesses for Steve and, and, and managed those over the, over the course of that eight and a half year period. Uh, wow. That was a lot. Um, one of the things that struck me was the way in which you grind initially to be able to get information that you can't get anywhere else. And you do that by getting on the call, calling up people, being personable, trying to be able to get them to trust you and then give information to you that you can then, once you systematically try to cover a space, create unique insight that doesn't exist anywhere else. And I think that's a primary part of primary research that you're generating research and information that it's just, you can't get anywhere else. Um, but that's kind of difficult to scale, right? Like you can be one person calling up a bunch of people on the phone. Um, then you want to get a second person to call, a third person to call. Now you have a team and managing the information that you're collecting, the processes that you develop to be able to target specific questions and answer specific um, problems isn't something that's obvious of how you structure a team around that. You've been doing that as long as anyone else. So I guess, how do you think of the scale and the design of the information collection process? And then we're going to obviously get to how you can start leveraging AI to enable that to be more systematic, to mm -hmm. be able to capture more information, to be able to structure more systematically mm -hmm. and potentially disrupt the primary research space. But you have to have a process first in a data model that that information can flow into. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of information that has so much entropy that it's really difficult to be able to extract insight. So how, how do you approach the scaling in data problem of primary research? So, you know, it, at the end of the day, it, it is, um, it's, it's always grounded in the fundamentals, right? So um, the lingua franca that we all have on Wall Street, which is quite powerful, is uh, understanding companies, uh, tickers, um, events, uh, and KPIs, right? And so, you know, one of the things that was an early lever point in training young people. And by the way, we were hiring 23 to 25 year olds um, out of college um, to do this work uh, on the scale points um, in large part because um, that's a point in, 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 in someone's life cycle where um, they're willing to put in the hours. This is, it is, it is a high intensity uh, time and seat business, um, especially when you're running calls, right? You know, there's the, the math is really simple. Um, 
you know, a, a per, you know, of each call co- it takes 45 minutes and you want to compete on sort of a couple of different levels. Um, the way sort of historically I always competed in, in, in on the call side, um, you know, sort of high level um, was, you know, sort of everybody has access to expert networks, right? Expert networks are commoditized, right? You can, you can go to anywhere from the traditional old guard of GuidePoint or, you know, Gerson um, or, you know, Third Bridge to the new guard and, you know, Alpha, Alpha Wise or Alpha Sense, whatever, the, whatever those guys, Alpha Sites. Mm-hmm. I was never a big component of expert networks as I, I got further in my career. Um, but, you know, you, you can go buy calls. Uh, you could buy a package of a thousand calls, call it. And, you know, sort of, you, it, you, and you have coverage and the way you want to cover an ecosystem um, and the way we scaled uh, was never at the ticker level, but at the ecosystem level. So you don't, you don't necessarily do work in cabinets. You do, you know, floor, excuse me, in, in fortune brands, you do it in cabinets and it covers more ground and so on and so forth. But at a fundamental level, um, what you're really starting to do is you put someone, you know, put someone in a seat and over a five day period, if they do, you know, sort of it's seven calls a day, that's 45 minutes per call. Uh, they're writing those calls up. Um, you know, they're, 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 they're sending some sort of synopsis at the end of the day, um, you know, because there's collection, synthesis, and transformation, right? That's sort of the three legs of the stool when you're thinking about any research business. And what's, 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 what's really, that, it's, that's a 13 or 14 hour day. Right? Mm-hmm. They grind. And the, those teams have always ground. Um, and and, and, and in, in doing so, they're competing on doing more calls and having a better sample for those calls. Um, and doing them at a higher degree of frequency. So, you know, quarter, you know, instead of doing something quarterly, the traditional, the traditional com- competition for me back in 07, I was competing against an analyst at a hedge fund who was doing five checks at the end of every quarter to, you know, so with a, with a confirmation bias likely and table stakes calls that everybody was doing around the names that they cared about. And I was ripping 15 to 20 per month. And so I'd be, you know, I'd be 60 calls in by the time they were checking their four and I would do their four and then add another 15. So I was beating them on frequency. I was beating them on, you know, sort of momentum and trajectory. And I was also beating them on sample size, right? And sample quality. So, you know, that was the way to compete in the commodity business was around scale infrastructure and compliance. But fundamentally, getting back to the point, right? Like at the end of the day, the real carabiner is you need everyone on your team Whatever, however big your calls team is, if it's two people or ten people or twenty people or fifty people, they all need to understand how the waterfall works in a PNL, and they all need to understand how to calibrate and you know and collect in a way that is structured and synthesized um, against scripts that uh, you know a, a compliance cares about. You want to make sure that they're asking questions that they should be getting answers to, and making sure they're managing their compliance framework dynamically on the front end of every call. Um, and then they are they, they they collect in a way that is synchronized across the team, so that people are interchangeable, and you're looking at the same thing across every sort of uh, channel check runner, right? And so that that really comes down into into breaking down the P and L into traffic and transactions and ticket, um, and you know understanding mix math and all of the things, and you really sort of integrate that in a structured way, so that it allows you know these twenty three year olds to really start to understand what they're doing, right? Because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, one of the things that we'll get into, we should talk about too, is like, um, the, like Wall Street is an apprentice business and time in the seat matters, mm-hmm. right? It's, it's an experiential learning business, right? It's, it's white collar, right? Like, but, you know, sort of, um, you know, one of the things that I do get, you know, sort of, I do wonder about is, is how does AI actually, um, it makes things more efficient and easier for people to access but from a training perspective, you know, a thousand calls, you know, gets you further down the field on understanding how a, how a supply chain and an ecosystem work that allows for somebody to grow into, you know, something more substantial in terms of like, they want to be an analyst, they want to do another thing, they want to go up the curve, right? Mm-hmm, they want to mm-hmm. go up that curve. It's a great baseline foundational element. And so I always, I always wonder about the trade-off of AI with regards to that early training, mm-hmm. right? Those, those early days when working 14 hours a day does matter. Totally. Right. Totally. You know what I mean? And so, but it really is around the lingua franca of, um, you know, sort of uh, what I would call uh, financial statement analysis that you'd learn from, uh, le- learn from undergrad or business school, um, Porter's Five Forces. Th- th- these are all frameworks that get inculcated early on and should be inculcated early on in your calls business uh, because you're really starting to think about those different cross currents and cross sections to understand so that you can start to communicate effectively 
not only because you're just tracking change, mm -hmm. running a sequential research operation, what you end up invariably doing is finding your, 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 your trend line and then tracking change and momentum. Mm -hmm. right? And so, um, but it comes back to and starts with being able to walk through the waterfall of an industry, the walk through a waterfall of a business and a set business segment, right? And that's where it begins and ends. Um, and then, you know, you, you, you create a lot of scaffolding in the first three months. Um, and that's a pl first place where I think an AI agent could be interesting is around training, right? Um, and, and looking for anomalies um, that would come from the calls relative to what's happened before and what would be expected in a call of that nature based on a corpus of training data. Something like that could be really interesting because it's, like it's like climbing with the rope. Mm -hmm. right? and, um, and then, you know, sort of once they get enough calls under their belt and you can see um, that they understand the financial components, understand how to ask about inventory levels, how those inventory levels tie back to the balance sheet, how that ties back to, you know, sort of the sales trajectory and sort of understanding the flows of all the different sort of striations in the organization that they're, that they're researching. You know, once, once you start to see that, then you let them loose. And then, you know, sort of the way that happens, then you start looking at the body of work that they're doing. So you start at the call level, can they run a call? And then is, can they put together a project? Mm -hmm. And then once they put together a call and then a project, it's like, okay, can they then run a business? Mm -hmm. And the business is six checks, right? And then can they teach somebody else? And these are all steps along the process of like growing them into sort of being sort of management capability. And so, because then that's where you really start to scale is when, you're, when your callers become call managers mm -hmm. and you start to scale. It's, it's, it's not dissimilar to like, uh, you know, Avon. Mm -hmm. But the, the whole model, you know, sort of around this primary research came from my first job at Tudor where I was running these calls to cold call, right? Like you have to, you have to learn how to carry a conversation in a bucket. You got to be able to pitch. You got to be able to collect. You got to be able to understand where they live in the world so that you can tailor the conversation the way you need to. And you got to be able to document and capture everything in a way that allows for somebody else to come in and see exactly what you did. It's not that different, right? And that's the Summit and Summit Partners or TA Associates model that was really spawned in like the late seventies in Boston around deal sourcing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, one of the things that we're starting to do with our clients is include AI agents that auto transcribe on their expert network calls that they have with various different expert networks. And it will one transcribe everything. So there's nothing that's lost. And we will go into the call with specific questions that we want to be able to answer. And then after we get the transcript from the call that the AI has recorded, it will know the questions that we were trying to ask ahead of time and auto parse and pull out the pieces of information. Yeah. So the transcription after or the, the summarization after the call is just automatically generated that the email sends out. Straight we get, synthesis. Exactly. And we have the specific data points that we were looking for. We automatically pull that out into a structured a uh, CSV file or a structured database so that you still have the person on the call. Like you still need the human that makes somebody feel comfortable talking to them unless they're just getting paid for it, in which case you could have a an AI use something like whispers and ask the questions directly. But when you need that personal element of talking to somebody and trusting them, you still have a person on the call, but you have an AI that's automatically transcribing, pulling out the information, synthesizing, pushing that into the structured data product. So after the call, the person doesn't, all right, now how do I summarize an email? Pick up the call again. And so how do you spend, how do you optimize their time on call, making sure that you don't lose anything through the information extraction process through the AI, uh, but then work on the automatic structuring of that over time. It's set up really well for, um, entry level or medium level caller, right? Mm -hmm. Who are running off a script, mm -hmm. right? And there's a checklist that you're going to want to run on every call because you want to have sort of a repeatable longitudinal framework for understanding when people are right, when people are wrong. You can start to grade different consultants on visibility in the space and understanding it and all this other stuff. Um, I, you know, it, one of the things that gets really interesting and I, I'd be curious how the agent works is like when I, like, when I would run a call by the end, um, it would be far more meandering mm -hmm. and, and it would be way more, there was no script, so let's just put it that way. Um, and it would be way more exploratory and anecdotal and hypothetical. Mm -hmm. And so like I would run more hypothetical calls, which is like, you know, let's say this happened. 
mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And and then I would play this out with these ex- experts um, based on their experience and what they could see in the world. And I would pull them into hypothetical conversations, which were purely hypothetical, um, because at the end of the day, it's still decision tree economics downstream, right? You're still looking in, a, you're still living in a, things are getting better, staying the same or getting worse, right? It's one of those three modalities. And you always live in sort of a tripartite decision tree matrix because once pruning, when you start pruning, it gets, it, you, you're always pruning to a binary outcome. Mm-hmm, right? mm-hmm. And so it's just a really nice space, right? It's not infinite. Mm-hmm. Isn't it? Like you can create an infinite decision tree matrix in these calls. The best thing to do is to try to get to a binary outcome with a probability weighting as fast as possible mm-hmm, right? mm-hmm. Um, at a call level, but more at, at the collective level. Um, but I, I, I think the idea of synthesis and structuring is, you know, I, like it's going to save time to market, you know, sort of for insight, because like I actually think um, a call output is an input. And a, co- a call collective is an insight, mm-hmm. right? So, because like, you can have bias and skew, and there's geographic bias, there's there's visibility bias, there's all these different biases on any one call, and that's always the challenge, right? Which is it, it was actually one of the reasons you know sort of the industry had a problem back in sort of the m- mid two thousands was because people try to get scale by talking to the guy who knew the answer. This mm-hmm. is fundamentally what they were doing. Right? Mm-hmm. And it was it was a scale point, right? And like the way you want to create scale is through diffusion of having all compliant calls that you can do the right way, and that's that's the framework that that you know sort of the firms I, I worked at really deployed. So um, you know it's it's really compliance first, and then you manage against that. Um, but I do think you can do um, some really cool compliance stuff like with some of the stuff you're talking about. There's a really too cool cool compliance angle there. Um, that I think that's pretty meaningful. Um, that's a check and balance on the callers for the legal team. Mm-hmm. Uh, Can you give, like give an example? Like, what is the compliance element of uh, doing primary research calls? Oh, I mean, it's it's, it's so compliance is integrated at every stage of the conversation. If if you want to if you want to do it the, in the best possible way, it's with complete open palms and transparency. And that's the way that's the way it was at the firms I worked at. Um, you know, you're inserting compliance everywhere from. Uh, you know, sort of uh, the onboard and, you know, set up the setup of a call with a consultant gets checked off. And I'm sure I was working that way at the firms you worked at, um, where you, you, you'd get a, you'd get a consultant on the call. And then you'd sort of, before you got on the call, the, 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 there'd be a pre-approved compliance script. The script would be approved by compliance. Um, and then, um, you know, sort of, uh, there would be a disclaimer at the beginning of the call. And the disclaimer at the beginning of the call is really about, it, it's, it's fundamentally saying, hey, listen, um, you are who you say you are. Um, you know what you can and can't talk about. If you can't talk about something, we don't want to talk about it, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? So like really setting the bounds, because like it's one of those things, if you don't ask for it, you're not going to get it. And if you tell them you don't want it, you definitely won't get it, right? And so that's an important sort of framing on the beginning of the call. It sets the call up the right way. And then at the end, you got your notes. And then, you know, they, they get looked at by compliance. Um, so compliance is in everything. And then the synthesis that then goes to, you know, sort of the, the, the broader constituency gets looked at by compliance again. So like, you know, when, when you have legal and compliance, you know, basically running your research process for all intents and purposes, and, um, and or at least inserted at every node, um, you're managing to the most important things, which is intent and duty. You want to do the right thing. You're doing everything in your power to do the right thing. And you're making sure that you're not getting, you're not supposed to get to keep it out of the firm. You know, and that's super important, right? And that's, you know, in large part how, you know, sort of these businesses, uh, these, these, these different specific businesses were built um, and contained. So like, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really sort of good framework. And if you think about those different nodes, you can have AI agents checking on, every, first of all, a governance and compliance, you know, agent that's sort of collecting along the way that checklist and making sure that checklist is getting hit. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's that sort of natural audit trail, which exists already, but you can probably streamline it. Um, there's also, you know, sort of the the checks on the on the on the different elements of, uh, you know, sort of the notes, you know, the, cre- the the notes are being created. They could also be checked, not just for pulling out into a SQL or to a CSV, but also every time a public company is named, I'm making it up, um, there could be sort of like a flag. And, you know, sort of the flag could then have a context clue around what's it, what is it actually about? You know what I mean? Is that like, there are different types of ways it could be mentioned. I'm, you know, again, I'm spitballing. Mm-hmm. Um, but that creates a flag that then, you know, raises it to um, sort of the legal team to do a deeper dive, making it up. 
Um, and then you could do the same thing on the report, you know, sort of just a st stress test against what's in the world and what's differentiated, mm -hmm. right? We, we've gone pretty deep on the, the primary research side, and I want to touch on a couple other uh, examples. But one of the things we haven't done is, like, give a, a good example of a primary research uh, project that some of these large funds do. Because I don't think everyone really appreciates the scale and depth and size of the effort around some of these research projects. Um, so is there any like project or an example that you can think of that if somebody was just doing my own investments on my own, I manage my own PA, and I'm thinking I can compete with the type of research that some of these big funds do. And if I actually knew what they did, you'd be like, wow, like there is so much time and effort spent into this that it would just, it feels like it's difficult to to be able to compete with something like that. So like, what's an example of something that you guys would do? So, 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 yeah, so big, big picture, right? There are two types of checks that exist, so channel checks, right? And, you know, these are, these are, these are, you know, for, for, for all intents and purposes for this conversation, there's going to be about, you know, call it 15 to 20 calls uh, per, per check or per report. Um, and that is going to be, do one of two things, if not both. The first thing it's going to do is it's going to sort of be a trend check. How are things going? Very broadly speaking, you know, you're tracking change, right? It's like, you know, think about any sort of, uh, you know, sort of think about roofing. Roofing is a good example, right? Um, you're, 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 you're tracking roofing, you're doing it on a monthly basis, um, you know, sort of, uh, and what you're doing is you're talking to people throughout that ecosystem, home builders, you're talking to private hardware shops, you're talking to distributors, it's a big distribution network, uh, you're talking to private manufacturers, Right. Like in the usually there, I think there are seven in the States. There's ICO and GAF and Owens Corning is the public. Um, you know, you've got Beacon, who's a big distributor. And then you've got sort of your you've got your roofing contractors. Um, and, you know, sort of those are those are usually sort of both public and private companies. Um, and you're talking to people at every note of that chain to better understand supply demand dynamics, competitive dynamics, pricing dynamics. And you're doing that monthly and you're doing it monthly because, um, you know, things move fast. Uh, the cycles can turn every 30 to 45 days. It's a heavily we weather dependent uh, business. So the way roofing works is roofing is really a bond and an option, right? If you're thinking about the business, it's about a hundred million squares a year that are maintenance, you know, like they just age out, they get old, have to be replaced. And then all of the outsized uh, opportunity really comes in hailstorms uh, in the South, 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 South by Southwest, uh, as well as hurricanes, right? And those and so weather impact is a meaningful thing. And if you don't get weather, it's not as interesting. And inventory levels matter because it's a branded commodity business. And so that's sort of the game. Trend is the first part. There's also an education. Education would be, you know, specific within roofing. Um, it would be a special, you know, readout. Uh, and it would be around a factory being deployed in West Texas. So a factory is going up and it's 100 million squares a year. It's not, that's a big, that's a big factory, but it's a, it's a big factory. Uh, how's it going to impact sort of regional dynamics and competitive dynamics for folks in that part of the world? Because the cool thing about roof, uh, roofing shingles, if anybody knows anything about asphalt roofing shingles, um, they don't travel well. They get compressed. They start to stick into each other because the asphalt gets sticky and melts. And uh, they actually only travel about 300 miles. So you put a concentric circle around a factory and they, they usually go flatbed truck, but they're really heavy, rail or ferry. And so you spend time and it's an education check and it's really about understanding a specific event that you're trying to understand in that frame, right? And that's really fundamentally, if you think about research generally um, in, in the space at the big shops that are trying to sort of navigate, they're trying to understand, uh, you know, business momentum and in the, in the, in the businesses that they care about and then how those businesses are utilizing events and responding to events that impact the day-to-day -day of their said business, right? And so it's event-driven, catalyst-driven understanding of momentum and change in the industries. And that's what these, that's what, that's what these entire research e ecosystems are about. Um, that's a, that, that, you know, that, that, that'll take a week. You're competing with like, um, in, that, in that frame, you're competing with like Cleveland Research or North Coast. I'm dated. I haven't been in the business for a bit. Um, so that it, there could be other players in the space. And you're competing with now probably the transcript businesses out of the big dogs. Um, you know, like Alpha Alpha Sense and um, uh, or Alpha Sites. I'm sorry, and a couple of the others. Um, and then you 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 you're going to want to build sort of a data ecosystem around that as well, um, which could be a function of 
um, looking at sort of uh, peer reviews, for example, of roofing contractors or, you know, sort of open bids um, in, you know, different markets that you can see bidding structure on commercial um, housing permits and remodel permits or, uh, you know, an ind indicator. Um, and then starting to think about, you know, sort of where you can see, you can pick up inventory data if you can see it on websites or things of that nature. Um, th there's a really cool opportunity um, if, if, if people have the, the, the bandwidth to be able to build both a data and a calls context because the calls often inform the data in a more rich and textured way because you're getting context that you can't pick up from a streaming data asset, right? And so I've always been a big proponent of marrying one and the other. I'm talking my book. Um, it's those are the businesses that I built over the years. Um, but it is a comprehensive, full suite, full, full suite business. And, 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 and frankly, that, that, that one roofing, that, that's 15, it's a 15 hour, 20 hour project monthly, mm -hmm. right? You know, it's, if you're doing 15 calls at 40, 40 minutes a call, you're writing as you go. Um, you're spending 15 to, you know, 20 hours to sort of get that out. Right. And that's, that's, that's one person. And on the data side, if you're doing anything there, you know, you could be spending 25 hours total a month on roofing as an ecosystem. And that might be a little high. Um, but if you're it's doing some of the things you're talking about, I do think there's an opportunity to rip some of that, some of the, some of that time out. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the things that's really cool is you're now starting to bridge out to the other piece of information that you can gather around understanding a industry, a company, a segment that ultimately helps inform an investment decision. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I think a lot of people have a gap in is that I understand the research. I could do the data science of maybe just the data side, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean I can construct a portfolio, manage out factors, or be able to manage timing, understand catalysts, understand sizing. So you've at least been able to see a lot of that space. How do you tell more junior people that are just focusing on the primary research they're on the calls um, the context necessary to know that P&L waterfall that you were talking about earlier. So they know that they're asking the questions that ultimately matter. They're ultimately going to drive performance. I mean, you know, sort of uh, in the old days when I was starting these businesses, um, we would do whiteboard sessions and we would, I would literally get up and be like, okay, how does McDonald's make money? And we would literally do teach-ins um, and sit around and we'd eat subs at the eight o'clock at night. And, um, you know, we would, we would literally just say, okay, number of people that go into the store. Okay. That's traffic. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then what's, and then traffic has to turn into what? It has to turn into a transaction. So there's a conversion rate because not everybody that goes into the store. And so if you have a geolocation data asset and you're tracking traffic, that's not actually, that's a proxy for revenue, but it's not revenue. Right. So then you get into that conversion rate, which you got to do a transaction. And it's like, okay, what's in a transaction? What's, what's in a transaction? It's a, it's okay. It's a, it's a receipt, but what comes from that receipt? It's a card swipe. What's in that card swipe? Card Swipe's a Big Mac. It's a large fry. It's a medium Coke. Okay, cool. So what are those? Those are SKUs. And those SKUs have a price point, right? And those price points are X, Y, and Z. And so what do you think about this? So what if they have four SKUs instead of three? Okay, that's, a, that's called a tax rate. And then, you, you, and then you say, okay, how does, how does John Deere make money? What are the drivers of John Deere's business? John Deere, like it's, it's farmer balance sheet. What drives a farmer's balance sheet? Farmer's balance sheet is driven by the price of corn. Okay, so like, how does a farmer make money? So then we go into the farmer balance sheet and then like you, you just start doing it in every sector and then people would start specializing um, because sectorization is actually important in this because then you get scale, that's a place where you get scale density and velocity of your calls and you can start to, start to combine your calls. You can talk to one building materials distributor and cover four different, you know, sort of reports because, it, you know, in, you know when, when, you start it, when you start a calls business, building materials is the report but by, you know, sort of year three, it's HVAC, it's roofing, it's cabinets, it's flooring, it's housing, right? So all of a sudden you just like really rip that down because you get deeper into the space and you develop a, you know, stronger network and a better understanding. But it really comes down to reps and just time in the seat. You know, I, I whenever I hired somebody back in the day, and I always, I always talked about this is, um, you know, there are sort of three things that matter in your career, right? Um, whether or not you're smart, whether or not you have a process, and how hard you work. There's other stuff, and I'm not going to get into all of the things, mm -hmm. but like those are the inputs, especially in finance, right? And so whether or not you're smart, everybody's smart. It's table stakes, right? Um, and I'll, you know, again, I'm not going to get into the semantics, but like, you know, you're at the table, right? People are at the table. So then you, whether or not you have a process, and process is asymptotic. Over time, 
your process is going to continue to be efficient. That's the bet anyway, right? So those are the two things you want to compete on. First one is not a great competing one because like you're trying to say you're smarter than somebody else. That's a hard game. And process, competing on process, that works, but it gets to be asymptotic and then you have to scale by hiring people and everything else. And then it's a whole new learning process. And it's how hard you work, right? At the end of the day, the way I always say it is like, you know, I, I, you know, I spent a decade where I worked six hours on Sundays. That's 50 Sundays a year. Six hours a Sunday is 300 hours, right? I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how good your process is. If you give me a 300 hour lead, which is you know, 50 hour weeks, that's a six week lead. I'm going to beat you to the ball when it comes to doing calls and, and, and understanding what's going on in different ecosystems, especially if I have a machine built and it's being powered by, you know, sort of the constant learning of how these industries and supply chains work. Right? Mm -hmm. And so like that, uh, that time in the seat early on to learn the trade in this business, I think is invaluable. Um, does it create imbalances? Is it a tricky and challenging thing to navigate in terms of the overall part of your parts of your life? Absolutely, right? It's not there are trade offs, right? Mm -hmm. It's not it's not zero sum there. Um, but you know, at a fundamental level, I think the the true differentiator was I, I I got into these really cool blocking and tackling seats where the more calls you did, the more likely you were to collect and synthesize a differentiated view tied directly into like the view around work and time and work ethic. And, um, and that, and that frankly is, 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 is a huge differentiator in this game. Um, and it's still a blocking and tackling world because, um, we're so early in the data and primary research, uh, evolution and institutionalization game still, um, you know, that, that time and, you know, sort of really creating the at-bats is a differentiator because the tools haven't necessarily been built to make it easy for people to do yet. Mm -hmm. It still work, right? And like, it's still, you know, sort of like standing up these calls businesses is, 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 is you're getting to the whole thing, the lingua, developing a lingua franca around how fundamentals work, that's a thing and it's not easy to do. And that's, that's where it's really important because the quality matters, right? Like at the end of the day, you could do a ton of calls, but if it's wrong all the time, it's not gonna stick. Mm -hmm. So it has to have a hit rate and it has to be as, as measurable metrics for success that come from a quality quotient that can be underwritten, right? And so um, I, I think that, you know, sort of, uh, I, I'm excited about the tools as they come because I do think they're going to create massive amounts of efficiency and they're not going to change the importance of frameworks, archetypes, and developing the right language for the whole organization to key around. If anything, the language is going to be super important because the agents are going to have to plug into it too, mm -hmm. right? So I, I think it's actually really exciting because it's going to force a structuring uh, into a lot of organizations that is going to be scaling for them. Mm -hmm. And that language doesn't necessarily need to be overly complex. I think the way that you went back to first principles when you were talking about how does McDonald's make money and they have brick and mortar, they have, I mean, now some online, yep. but you can capture different pieces of that wallet supply chain going from consumers into McDonald's eventual revenue statements and income statements. Um, and that's something that's not overly hard for at least an engineer data science to understand. Like there's a lot of nuance that if you want to cover McDonald's because there's just a lot of different factors. But from a first principles perspective, I think that's awesome. And you can do that across a lot of different companies that bus whose business model shouldn't be overly complex. Um, and then from that, you start building out what you're saying, lingua franca or a taxonomy or a data model where you're oftentimes not focusing on what's the company stock going to do. That might be way you, the way that you monetize it, but there's a company and then there's segments and there's product lines. And there is a general taxonomy that exists for all of these different companies. Ultimately, they have instruments. And this taxonomy measures KPIs mm -hmm. and the KPIs are a good indicator of the growth and performance of the company. And as you start developing this taxonomy internally, you can start associating credit card data set to a KPI that corresponds to revenue, that That's corresponds right. to spend of wallet. Mm -hmm. um, you can do a receipts data set, probably looking at a very similar thing. You can look at geolocation data for amount of people that are going on to a physical location. Um, and these data pieces ultimately tie up to different company KPIs, company segments, that then that gives you a really good mosaic or understanding of what's going on within the, the financial performance of the company you're covering. And if 
you can build that out systematically, which is what a lot of these funds end up doing. And they put experts in different elements. So they have uh, a Kirk, which is the Lawrence Taylor of building out the primary research. You have an analyst, maybe worked in the buy side in the industry for a really long time, or maybe they're in the sell side. They should be covering it. They know the ins and outs of these company. Sitting as an analyst, um, you have a PM that's basically been living this world for decades that can start piecing this information together with all the nuance and how the names are performed. Um, then you have a risk model that helps you hedge out things that have nothing to do with the fundamentals. Uh, you then start hedging that risk out, lever up your position. So the volatility you do have is very concentrated in the idiosyncratic returns. And like, as long as you have the Lawrence Taylor at each one of those positions, and you have an, an, a true expert that's sitting at the seat that's constructing that portfolio within that framework, you have something that's really special and differentiated. Yeah. And, and what I think you just laid out too, is just this, um, really incredible trajectory of what's happened to the industry since the early nineties when, you know, sort of the, the, what I would call the, 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 the mega funds of today really started at the beginning of this massive asset cycle, which is the institutionalization of the business. It was just, you just laid it out, right? Like, you know, these, these businesses were, you know, sort of have evolved over 20, 30 year period. And, and, and what's really compelling is like, the, the, we're pulling apart each part of the investment cycle process managing the risk, executing on the trade, uh, managing the portfolio, understanding the stock, understanding the fundamentals. Like those are all different components inside of a lot of these firms and packaged in, 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 and executed in different ways in different shops, depending on where your competitive advantage sits. But like it is the, it is fundamentally the evolution of, you know, an industry that started with a couple of you know, sort of, uh, you know, sort of a, a couple of, a couple of big managers back in the early nineties, you know, these, these businesses mm -hmm. are massive and it's, it's the institutionalization of the business, which is, it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating thing because, um, you know, the, 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 the job of those big shops is to always be living in the alpha space, you know, and always fight beta. Mm -hmm. And what's cool about that is, and you talked, we, we talked about this, you know, in our pregame, um, they're, they're, you know, sort of, they're always innovating to stay in the alpha space, but as things institutionalize, things naturally become beta. Mm -hmm. And so they're constantly pushing and innovating and developing tools and tool sets and people, right? This is still a people business, you know? Um, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a really interesting time in the business and the space, right? So like, I, th I think there's gonna be a massive amount of transformation over the next, call it 12 to 36 months from all the stuff that's happening in generative AI and, and, and some of the other tools. And you guys are, you know, on the bleeding edge of that, which is really cool. Yeah, I appreciate it. I mean, that's that's essentially what we do at Hedgineer, where we work with the hedge fund that's been around for a while, or they're just spinning up, and they realize they know their asset class really well, they have a differentiated view, but there's all these elements of running the business of a hedge fund, and how do you make that scale? And there's a couple funds that have done that really well over the, class, over the past like 10, 20, 30 years, that for a long time, their processes and the operations there was alpha, but over time that gets disseminated into the market and it becomes beta. So right. um, the way that you take a risk model and like, especially an equities risk model, you then do the linear algebra, taking the covariance matrix of factors, the loadings of factors, uh, the factor returns, and you look at a portfolio and it tells you what your volatility is, your dollar vol in each one of these factors. And then easily make a suggestion of, oh, if you add in these other portfolio uh, pieces, whether it's basket indices or these couple single name positions, scale up, scale down, you're going to have a more balanced portfolio, more concentrated idea where you want it. And so a lot of funds built up a lot of systems to be able to make that easy, it's just not hard anymore. Um, or the way that you start having single dashboards with what's our, all the names in our portfolio, what's our exposure for each name, what's our 30 day P&L, what is the KPI that all of the analysts across the street are trying to estimate? Yep. What is its what its consensus est consensus estimate? What is the estimate for your analysts mm -hmm. internally? Mm -hmm. What is all of the alt data saying for what that one or two KPIs are? What is the summary of the upcoming or all of the analyst research on themes that mattered? Throw that into an AI agent. What's the upcoming earnings call? When is it? Um, what's the upcoming conferences sure. that these analysts are on? And then who is the analyst that we have covering this name? So if you're the PM, you just go through this one dashboard. It has 
all of your portfolio analytics, all of your research, all of the data, what's the calendar and when does this stuff matter? Um, just flowing through. Yep. And that was hard to do maybe just three or four years ago. Now it's easy. Like there's been so many reps that at least for us, we've been able to do with different funds and implementing this that now it's just kind of like print and repeat. Mm -hmm. And the real differentiator now is like the insights that your investment teams have, the insights that your por your portfolio manager has. You always like, want to, yeah, like you're, you're hitting on this really cool point, which is like at the end of the day, we're all in the content business and the content is around trading risk. Mm -hmm. right? And like, you know, whatever you're working on has to be relevant, right? So if you were, if you were, if you were putting together a dashboard on factors from South Africa for a domestic U.S. hedge fund, it's not relevant. Totally, right? Totally. So the relevance has to be there. That's kind of table stakes. Mm -hmm. Then, then it has to be about accessible. And it sounds like you guys have really nailed down, you know, so through iterations and just knowing how people consume information mm -hmm. and how they visualize information, which is which is nuanced and very difficult. The, the user experience and the user interface. Are super hard to get right. Totally, but like totally. if you if you get if you get the configuration to a place where everybody starts to standardize around it, it's a home run. And then you put it back in the you put it all back in the middle of differentiation. How do you differentiate your the inputs coming into the dashboard? Mm -hmm. That's where you want to win, and that's more data, differentiated data, and better questions. Right. So how do you constantly turn that machine, whether it's you know sort of from your model capabilities or from your your collection capabilities around differentiation, or you've come up with a new risk factor model because you're not using traditional bar. You've actually, you've evolved it to be your own mm -hmm. and, you know, sort of, and, and, and that's where you want to differentiate and compete. And if you're, you know, a big shop that understands the factor frameworks and the factor models really well, you're probably doing evolution and div innovation on that. Some people are competing on information and some people are competing on sort of scale and lever points, right? But like, it's a really fascinating game when you're able to get back into that. How are we differentiated? Because at the end of the day, that's where competitive advantage really lives. Totally. And the infrastructure doesn't need to be the competitive advantage. Like the no. infrastructure should just be the beta that everyone has. And your differentiated view of the world, whether it's in risk space, whether it's in fundamental space, whether it's more systematic space, the tools that you use to be able to allow your differentiated understanding to bubble up and surface that can be commoditized, but the view and the opinion and your understanding of the world around you that no one else could replicate, like that's where your alpha is. And the more time you can spend on that, that's how you win and not spending time on data warehousing initiatives or like how do we want to create the right dashboard or, or Windows upgrades, like all of that stuff should be commoditized, you don't spend time on it. And you should be spending time on what is your unique perspective of the world and how do we make sure that we validate it, that it's correct. And then once we do that, how do we get that into our portfolio in a risk adjusted way? And that's the name of the game. Um, one of the things we haven't touched on yet is like, I would love to go into Carbon Arc, mm -hmm. right? Like you spent a lot of time in the space um, you have a unique, this is your alpha, right? Like your understanding of data and information and how it flows throughout the, I guess, the world at a very like meta level um, in how that can be better monetized sometimes by funds, but also by operators. Like we, right. we talk about investment managers, how could you better use credit card data to forecast out subs for, well, not subs, but how could you forecast out top line growth for Macy's? But what about how you can use that data to help Macy's be That's able right. to better understand their business? And I think in our space, we kind of overlook like, the operators themselves. I think you kind of went directly to that. Yeah, talk, started there. Talk to me about it. So, so you know, just to just to give a little bit of the origin story, you know, sort of as far back um, as a bunch of years ago, um, you know, started to started to realize that for all the data that existed in the world, very little of it was making it into the hands of decision makers. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, I was I was blessed to work at at a, at, a, at a fund in a shop that that sort of. Um, you know, really sort of wanted to, you know, innovate around, uh, you know, research inputs. And so we were able to sort of work with, uh, you know, a lot of really cool data. Um, but, you know, sort of really quickly started to look at the market structure of data in the world and, and realized that there were a number of things that were creating wild imbalances uh, for data such that it was, it was uh, wildly difficult to get. Uh, it was expensive. Um, and the number of people that needed to touch it before it could be usable and consumable and make sense 
um, was prohibitive, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it worked for us and it, pro and it worked for where you worked, right? But like for, for the vast majority of funds, let alone the companies that, uh, you know, sort of we were, you know, sort of trying to understand better, um, it was a non-starter for them to be able to do anything real with data. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so they, they, they not only had problems with their own first party data that was siloed and in all these different places and really hard to get, but, you know, sort of between the malinvestment in the cloud, too much money going into too many companies in the cloud and creating tons of silos. Um, the, you know, the big tech monopolies that, you know, sort of basically hoovered data in and didn't let it out. Your walled garden oligopolies that, you know, sort of in analytics platforms that didn't create a free flow of data in and out and also were really quite expensive, um, as well as your traditional data monopolies like a Nielsen or an IRI or in real estate, CBRE, you know, frankly, being table stakes and also, um, you know, sort of built on yesterday's technology, but making it really difficult for new data sets and data providers to come to market and scale. And so all of these things were happening and it was like, you know, it was like, uh, you know, uh, it was this really difficult thing. So after COVID, um, you know, co-founded CarbonArc and the idea was, let's build a platform, let's go with corporate, um, you know, did some, did some work on the corporate space and looking at sort of like how insights were being delivered to the corporate space. And it was largely based on folks who stood in front of a data set, partnered with that data set and delivered an insight. Um, or very verticalized, you know, sort of data monopolies or s small aggregators that, you know, owned a space and, you know, sort of had this belief that, um, you know, if you think about, you know, data as, as, as sort of people have been talking about data as an asset class or data as oil or all the things, um, you know, sort of if you think about what an insight actually is, um, an insight is a transaction on a data set. And that transaction uh, is really a structured product because it has time decay and eventually is right or wrong. It has volatility. It is right or wrong, right? Uh, and it has a cash flow associated with it, right? So those are the three things you need to price an option, right? So if you believe in that sort of construct conceptually that, um, you know, sort of data is an asset class, data is money, um, let's apply financial system first principles and let's start building out, um, you know, a platform ecosystem um, focused on insights to corporate space uh, to really start to prove out, because when you build a platform, platforms are brutal because you have to build the platform and you have to build a product to prove that the platform works. And you have to do both of those things before you run out of money. That's hard, right? Like, and it's a grind and it's a big conceptual story. And we didn't go at um, the idea of like, let's build into this one vertical because we didn't want to be pigeonholed. We went for the whole thing. So we went out and built relationships um, with a number of, uh, you know, sort of data, data providers around how people spend their time how people spend their money and their balance sheet, right? And looked at and sort of uh, building into um, an, an ecosystem layer where we bring everything in, we structured on 2030 tech, not 2015 tech. And we sort of say, okay, um, let's really get into what this is about, which is entities and an entity framework around companies and brands and people and locations and then events. And like, let's have an exhaustive event study, right? Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, you need an entity, an event, and an impact. And the impact can be a hypothesized impact, like I think this is going to happen and I want to test it. Or it could be a data observ observability impact, which is this is happening. Let's see what happens next. So in one, you're doing an A-B test. And the second, you're doing, uh, you're basically building a, a, listening, a listening framework, right? And let's, let's sort of really start to build into this and structure this in a graph um, and sort of we went graph instead of table and um, we were seeing where the where the puck was going with 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 sort of new pushes in AI. And we started building into a customer set that was corporate based for the first couple of years and in the entertainment space, uh, in live events, uh, professional sports, uh, leagues and teams, uh, brands, um, healthcare services, and then recently um, went into financial services a bit, right? Really centered around building um, this textured uh, platform where the insights move, the data sets don't. So really, the data sets start getting worked like farmland and the insights are the bushels of corn that get pushed out to the decision makers. And those decision makers either take that insight and make a decision on it or take the, a, a bevy of insights, put them into a model to derive an insight framework model. 
right? And we w- what we're doing to break the wheel, um, you know, sort of Game of Thrones style is, um, you know, really trying to move to a consumption model for our customers. Because one of the big blockers was, you know, sort of if you wanted to buy a card panel on Wall Street in 2013, it cost several million bucks. And there were a few firms that could use it. When you had it, it was alpha. And by 2018, everybody had credit card panels of some degree. And the price point had moved down concurrently because providers had come into the market such that today there are probably, you know, sort of less than a dozen, but more than a half dozen card providers of different types. And, you know, sort of, you know, paying a license is paying a license, but there's a barrier to entry based on willingness and ability to pay. And the reason something like card is really interesting is because like card is still, you still have 250 tickers, you know, most, most of these sort of panels um, that you can trade four to 10 times a year to generate sort of that actionable cash flow and improve your hit rate by a couple hundred basis points um, and then drive that through to sort of an ROI on that that's, that's firmly ROI positive, even a table stakes environment um, where alpha is, you know, sort of largely degraded because of the competitive dynamics of cart, right? Um, fast forward to what we're trying to think, what we're thinking about is, um, you know, if they, you know, if, if they're, if they're, you know, sort of, if they're a hundred, uh, if there are a thousand car, uh, data providers today, commercial in the world, we think in three years is going to be 10,000. And we think in five years, there's going to be a million. If there are a million providers of data in the world in five years, which data set you're working in doesn't matter. It's what questions you're asking. And do you have the right frameworks to ask the right questions? And so we're trying to set up this platform to be able to service the nascent AI economy and deliver inputs, insights, weights, and biases, structuring capabilities, and enrichment and augmentation for these companies to solve their CLTV equation. Targeting, acquiring, upselling, and retaining, to understand store placement, um, to think about supply chain dynamics through inventory management components, and then looking back at, you know, boluses and problems in freight or in at the ports, um, understanding, th- you know, th- other countries and dynamics there, um, you know, sort of, and, and then creating with the data providers um, a consumption-based model on the other side. So you got consumption out, consumption in, and then there's a, you know, sort of a transaction layer and that's that, and so we become a transaction processor. And we, you know, and, and there's a whole host of things we can think about on the other side, but there's a world where like people put insights into the environment. We actually let other people sort of integrate on top and innovate on top and push insights into the marketplace as well. Because like this could get to a place, where, you know, we're going to put blockchain in the back to manage some of the data. Um, you know, there's this, there, you know, there's, there's some real opportunities to explore the studio space here. Um, and, and, and I think it's, I think it's really interesting. We got about, you know, 15, 16 customers post revenue, um, about 20 employees. We're keeping it lean and mean using contractors where we need to. Um, and right now the, the big challenge that that we're dealing with is, is the accessibility problem. We took one data problem and made another one Mm -hmm. and solving that data problem. So like we might want to catch up and think about, it sounds like you guys have figured out configuration Mm -hmm. and accessibility. So I'd love to figure out how to work with you guys and think about accessibility frameworks on UX dashboards, right? Because we're not, we're not, we're not going crazy on the UX side because we're really a data products company, but it needs to be accessible and sourceable, right? And, you know, if, 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 if someone doesn't know something's there, they can't do anything with it, right? And so discoverability. Totally. It's, it's hard, right? Yeah. And so like, that's the problem that, that like, we're, like, we're, we're, we're doing well and like feel, feel really good about where we are. But that is the problem we're trying to really nail down and get that to a place where it's super seamless. Yeah, I think right now UI development with data is an interesting space because you have so many different options. Like at the raw layer, there's the you want to access data close to where it lives. So either Python APIs or Excel formulas, right? Like it, you can do a lot actually within Excel with a couple formulas that wrap a Python function or a standard API that goes, pings a database, sends it back. And one of the things that Microsoft did over the last, I think, three years is they enabled something called data spilling, where you could only have one formula in Excel and it would only be able to return data in in one cell. So if you have the formula in A1, it can only return data in A1. But Microsoft rolled out data spilling. So now you can have a formula in A1 and maybe it looks up what is the... Um, expected uh, amount of precipitation with this one uh, zip code start end date of Jan 1 to uh, December 31st. 
And it's then going to spill from A1 all the way down from A1 to A365. Yep. And like, so there's ways that you can start using Excel. But then there's some really like low barrier of entry frameworks like Streamlit that yep. are Python interfaces for rapid application development. So like if you have somebody that can wrangle some data, put it together in a, uh, a simple dashboard or some pandas data frames, and then you can wrap AG grid in it. You can wrap a lot of the matplotlib or the plotly charts. So that somebody that's just decent at Python working in a Jupyter notebook, yeah. they can really quickly just create a dashboard. And you can do that yourself. Like there's other companies that have frameworks for it, like I think Snowflake and both Databricks have like their own streamlit tools, but it's simple to do on your own. Um, and then there's like, you maybe go the Power BI route where you have people that aren't writing code, but they can connect to a SQL database. And they say like, oh, actually I want to be able to create dashboards in either a Power BI or a Tableau or Looker. We generally work with bigger orgs. So like Power BI and, and Tableau are the big two. And you can do a ton there as well once you have the underlying data model. Um, and then when that's not enough, then you go into other frameworks. So like React's been a, a, a big mm -hmm. one for a lot of UI development. You can do anything in React, yeah. but it, that starts adding complexity. It's complexity, and it, yeah, it's, it's its own developers too. Totally. Doing a lot, we're doing a lot with SuperSet. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's also HTMX. It's a new library that I've been a fan of. It's kind of like a nice in-between by being able to do a lot of the backend, uh, app, the backend element creation um, that then just gets injected into the DOM. So it's lightweight on the JavaScript side. It's a little bit heavier on the backend side. That can be in JavaScript or it can be Python, anything that you want. Um, and it helps for like a full stack developer do some UI, some backend. And figuring out like what is the right tool for a company's own data development experience because a lot of these companies that we work with like the like these funds are not necessarily overly technical but they want to be able to work without having a developer involved at all and so like they want an idea they want a dashboard and they want it like now and yes, so, yesterday exactly yeah. and so figuring out when you're building out a platform that has ui elements what's the right combination between like Let's just continue to double down on Excel. Let's take it a little bit higher up to Power BI and Tableau. Let's add just a little bit of code and do something like Streamlit. Or let's go a little bit more um, developer um, tech with HTMX. Or do we kind of want to go all the way to React? Yeah. Um, is like a different decision that orgs need to, to make when they yeah. think about UI development. And you, you can be, you can win that entire spectrum like there is no one solution for that it's kind of the question of how much you want so like and it's hard too right because like you know meeting people where they are right like exactly that's, that's like, the thing part, part part of the part of the thing was like um i i i, I got to watch the digital transformation at, at at a fund over a 10 year period for all intents and purposes from you know sort of nascent to wildly sophisticated right and like what that meant for visualization, what that meant for, you know, sort of delivery of API, API versus report versus Excel, you know, plugin, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So go to the website, corporate spaces like that, you know, and now like, you know, we're, we're walking in and having conversations with business users who want to leave at, you know, five o'clock and who want to do what they want to do. So it needs to be one button it needs to be super easy to use. But then you're, we're also, we're also selling the API plugin to folks who want to just suck it through the straw and at a gigabit level, right? And like, and, and get paid on, get paid by gigs, right? So like, so we get paid by gigs on that. That is, that might be in the same company. It might be at different companies. And like being ready to meet people where they are across all those modalities and then understand their journeys subsequently is actually, you know, sort of really nuanced, right? It's, it's part of the game. Mm -hmm. but, um, digital transformation has largely been stunted by the lack and dearth of data because you need data to digitally transform. And then you layer on the release of, you know, chat GPT and sort of like people focusing on machine learning and AI, which has been around for a long time, but this, this version of it has not, it becomes a consumer application. Everybody in the world is focused on it. And everybody's now focused on getting their data right. Then figuring out, oh, wow, we need more than just our data. And then how does that work? And, it, and the space is really tricky to navigate and you have very hard decisions to make because you have to make big decisions at a platform level. Like, am I going to partner with Azure and work with chat? Am I going to plug into Snowflake and work with their framework? Am I going to stay, you know, sort of out of that, sit on top of AWS and make different decisions? Like people are making those decisions now 
and it and and and, it, and it's not always an enterprise decision. It's sometimes even a departmental decision. And so they're all in those various journeys and like figuring out what data is, what data isn't, how decisions are made, what's going to be transformative, um, who stole their cheese, who's getting, who, who has the potential to, you know, cut their business, who has the potential to grow their business. It's a fascinating time in, in, in sort of the space because there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of opportunity. Mm -hmm. And people are excited, but they're also like, what's next? Right. But I think you painted it really well. Like you just go back to first principles and you're always going to fall back to that. Like you're always going to need to know what is, what's McDonald's? What's, they're, they're a company, they're an entity. And you were talking about that earlier. Okay. McDonald's has a ticker. Uh, McDonald's also has financial brands. statements. They have brands, right? And these Big brands Mac. are a Big Mac. They have these, these entity structure and these entities have financial KPIs associated to them. Um, yeah, they have metrics, KPIs. We have, we have metrics, KPIs, cohorts, and market shares. Mm -hmm. So we actually sort of institutionalize those four products. And the thing that will probably be the next is factors, mm -hmm. right? Because you can factor anything with enough data, right? So, you know, sort of just like factors blew apart, you know, sort of, you know, po post 08 factors became household common knowledge. You're putting them on fundamental, you know, there were no factors in 2006. Mm -hmm. There were factors on every fundamental PM dashboard that you're creating right now. Mm -hmm. Think about that, right? Yeah. Like, and that's a, that's a quantitative measure of an underlying asset class against itself and against others, right? Uh, around a number of different modalities and with pretty complicated math relative to sort of what traditional fundamental used to mean, right? And so even there you're seeing as more capital goes into a system and more data goes into a system, the institutionalization of, you know, sort of the, the, the mathematical factors and drivers of underlying assets, it becomes the thing. And so like, there's a world where like, you know, there's a brand resonance factor. There's a brand momentum factor. There's a brand value factor. There's a brand persistence factor on, you know, sort of Fenty beauty. Mm -hmm. You can factor it, right? You can, you know, and, and that becomes really interesting because now you're, you're, you're talking about, um, you know, sort of, a, you know, a, a product line and a brand. It's worth a couple billion dollars, whatever the number is. Um, and you've literally decomposed it in the same way you could, there's a celebrity factor in Fenty, mm -hmm. in Rihanna, right? So you've actually just decomposed it into all these different things, and you can now look at it against Capital One, Taylor Swift. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You can start to look at it against the rock, Under Armour, in the same language. Totally. And that gets really interesting. You know, that's where I think the, that's where I think the puck eventually goes. Totally. And that's what the factor model is designed to do is you right. look at what are the ABCs, what are the basic vitamins of a company and look at it in the same way you see the nutrition facts on the side of a box of cereal, be able to say like how much vitamin A, vitamin B, vitamin C, iron, calcium. And as there's these new factors that are starting to systematically affect companies, what is their sensitivity to them? That's right. And let's pull that out and be able to compare companies like for like in this one isolated element that didn't matter five years ago, but now the celebrity element, as you're pointing out, it's, big, it's a much bigger thing, right? Huge. Yeah, and and it and it's transformative, and you can see it in their advertising, and you look at it, and you look at it in the ad stack, and then you look at it. So that's that's you know sentiment, intent, engagement, and then you're getting into consumption, and then like you flow through to consumption, and like again, first principles. I just did the funnel. The funnel there was the ad funnel down into the consumption funnel, right? So like. Um, I, I, th I think that the, the opportunity for innovation around metrics and KPIs, uh, at the, you know, in the fundamental space is actually like at an all time high, right? Because the data is about to show up. Like we're not there yet, but like, um, a thousand data sets are going to go to 10,000, going to go to a hundred thousand. Um, everybody's in a rush for the door because there's a need for data, but like, um, the, 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 the fundamental problem, and you know, this from your, your last job and you're an engineer is like, let's say you're, you're managing a couple hundred data sets in production that are differentiated, require cleaning, processing, and everything else. There's going to be institutionalization of that pipeline and that supply chain because unfortunately engineering still scales fairly linearly, mm -hmm. right? And if somebody, if you keep buying all the data sets, you know, they stack on top of each other, you then, you, then you have, you go from 20 engineers to hundred engineers, then you have, then, then you're managing people problems, right? So it, it starts to become prohibitive and difficult for an organization to scale a data asset effort if they're only buying the data assets and they're not sucking in the insights, mm -hmm. right? So like that, that, that's the bet that we're making is that, you know, sort of the, the, the data asset market is going, to, is going to explode faster than people can scale up. And there's going to need to be 
a platform in the middle that's transforming around a common taxonomy and lexicon, uh, the key elements that people need to make decisions, Mm -hmm. whether it's in a stock, whether it's in a company, whether it's in an advertising campaign, they're going to want to pull the inside out, pay for it on a consumption basis because you collapse the prices, which then drives density and velocity, and then it flows through. And that's sort of the bet. That's, that's, that's what we're playing for. Sounds like an awesome bet to me. We'll see. So, Kirk, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, it was an absolute blast. We're going to have to do this again. Like, There's yeah. no way this is the, the first and only. So looking forward to when you come back. In- Whenever you want. Yeah, 100%, man. And with that, just want to thanks everyone for tuning in to the Hedgineer podcast. Again, I'm your host, Michael Watson. And until next time, we'll see you later. Thank you for joining. See you soon. Hedgineer.